Well, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here today, uh, 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. Try to keep your attention. Uh, so I'm David Norn. I'm the uh, manager of environmental services, as Doug said, for an engineering environmental firm in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the removal of underground tanks from a contractor and consultant standpoint. Uh, the main thing is, is that for us as a consultant, we often start the process with a phone call. We get a call that says, I've got a tank, I need to get it out. Uh, and the regulatory is part of that process. Uh, the premise that I'm working under though is, is that for a consultant or contractor, there's many, many things that happen and that need to occur before that tank comes out of the ground, before in essence the inspector shows up to take those soil samples and witness that tank removal process. So jumping into that, Really, there's a whole lot of planning, and that planning really starts with an assessment of this site. What are the conditions and constraints that we're going to have to deal with to get this thing out of here safely? And safety is the, the core uh, message to removal in underground tanks. And then to get to the site work part of this, right? So by the way, we are, we are a, uh, a licensed contractor as well. We're an AHAS contractor. So I, we're a consultant, we're geologists and uh, engineers uh, under that professional stamp, but we are also a contractor ourselves with an A-hazardous substance removal certificate. For us, that act, lets us act as a prime con uh, contractor. So we bring in subcontractors, and we, in essence, then are the tip of the spear in all this process to run the job. Um, it really is not a control thing, but it's really just to have a semblance of order as the job is then rolling forward. By the way, I'm going to premise this talk today to, I know that this is a broad swath of Coupa agencies in the state of California. Uh, it's been my experience that every agency is a bit different, uh, sees the requirements and the process a bit different. So I'll caveat this today. This is my experience uh, and working with the excellent regulators we have in the North Coast region. Okay, so look at it from a constraints analysis. We're walking onto a site, we're trying to get this tank out of here. We have regulatory requirements, we have our contractor requirements, we have things to assess. Uh, if you look at it from a constraints analysis, first and foremost, how are you gonna get, to get in and out of this site? If you're in a dense downtown area where you have a lot of pedestrian traffic, uh, what are the things you need to consider? How are you gonna get in and out? What's your safety requirements? What's your level of safety? What was in that tank? What was it used for? Uh, client objectives are always to do it uh, as cheap as you can, which runs into my next one, which is costs. Safety is our OSHA 29 CFR requirements for us. We, we are then uh, under obligation, then a requirement to do it in a safe manner in, in accordance with state and federal law. The regulatory process, really we're looking at jurisdictional issues. Again, they differ from area to area. In general, uh, the process is very similar, but there are differences. Basically for us, it's a communication process with the agencies as we go forward. So as we do this then, we actually prepare a work plan, site safety plan, and permitting that goes to the agency for uh, approval and review. Uh, very straight ahead, Form A, Form B. Uh, usually there's a COOPA um, uh, permit that goes with it. Uh, at the same time, there is a, uh, a, a work plan, a plan of work. How are we going to do this? What's our objectives? What are the LEL that we need to get to before that tank comes out? Uh, and how are we going to do this? In our area, we also notify other agencies. Oftentimes, it's fire department or a fire services type agency or a county agency. We typically bring in or notify, we don't bring them in, we notify then the regional water board personnel, and we notify public health. They have enjoined within the process then to be part of the oversight and witnessing the tanks coming out, mainly from the standpoint if it's a dirty site, if it's contaminated. Uh, usually the, the COOPA agencies have limited jurisdictional regulatory authority so that if you move into a, a, a contaminated tank site, usually that this site or the site investigation and cleanup process is done by others. Bringing in then the regional board or your public health uh, really enjoins them in the beginning of that process. Uh, for us too, and then I'm sure this is true through California, we have an airborne notification in, in uh, Bay Area, it's Reg 8 Rule 34. Uh, and then oftentimes, because you're working in city streets and sidewalks, there's encroachment. Okay, subcontractors. Uh, for us, we bring in an excavation contractor. We tend to work with the same guy all the time. Uh, John's excavating. He's pretty much the guy. Uh, has removed probably more tanks than I ever will. Uh, he's an A-hazardous substance removal contractor, just like us. Has tons of experience. Uh, at the same time, 
We bring in uh, other subcontractors as needed, whether it be a vac truck to dispose of our liquids. Uh, our lab, typically we use an off-site lab. Uh, we have used on-site labs before. And then when you're looking at putting a site back together, how are we gonna do that? Whether it be a geotechnical requirement, structural, paving, traffic, uh, planting new plants, because you ripped out the trees. Uh, site work and planning considerations, again, think about it from a process of safety and access. How are you gonna get in and get out? What's your safety requirements? Uh, how are you gonna exclude uh, portions of the site uh, and segregate a site either from people from the outside or to segregate the semblance of work and materials on site? The process then goes to uncovering that tank, inerting that tank, removing it. The decision becomes whether we could take it out of scrap metal uh, or does it have to go out as hazardous waste, depending upon the jurisdictional requirements, and then putting the site back together. Uh, staging considerations, the segregation of clean materials is always a must for us. Uh, if we can reuse material, we try to do that. Uh, you typically have to then have lab report or analytical on it to show that it's clean, uh, to reuse it. If you have contaminated materials, it's a very big issue. Oftentimes with a tank pole, you know, you're trying to get that tank out of there. But if you have contaminated material, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to put it? And how are you going to handle that? Equipment requirement really is to have equipment that's suitable for the, for the job. Our rule of thumb is a tank, a steel tank, a single wall steel will weigh about one pound per gallon of volume a tank. So a 10,000 gallon tank is about 10,000 pounds. Your typical backhoe, even a big backhoe, will not lift a 10,000 gallon tank. Uh, sanitary facilities, uh, we always bring a porta potty on site. Water to clean the site, traffic, pedestrian co controls, and, and again, encroachment. What's our requirements? To look at it, you know, we use sizable material. This is a 330 cat excavator done on a busy city street in uh, Santa Rosa. So uh, this is actually our typical machine. At the same time, access and staging, this is the same site when we go through an excavation standpoint. You can see on this site that we have structural shoring right, for stability. We have a lot going on. We have a bow mag compactor, we have a backhoe, and there's the excavator. We have a truck across the street to bring materials in and out. And we have safety and exclusion, and we have traffic control going on on this site. That site's about twice the size of this stage. Site control and work considerations. They're not all on the city street. Sometimes your biggest considerations are how you're gonna get in and out of the, uh, somebody's property without tearing it to pieces, because this site is a little home heating oil tank uh, that's in Petaluma, or was in Petaluma. So how are you gonna get in and out of here? Uh, again, it's just a consideration of how you're gonna do it with safety with access. Safety is a very big issue when it comes to traffic. Uh, most people just don't uh, really pay attention in my, my experience to barricade signs, please drive slow, men working. You really need to watch out for safety. We work under the Caltrans manual typically for safety and traffic control. Uh, and we have oftentimes hired specific contractors to handle uh, traffic for us, whether it be barricading signage or, or uh, temporary stop of traffic. Uh, it can become very congested, especially when you're moving materials in and out. Contaminated materials, big deal. So you pull a tank, that's the easy part. Uh, this is a very contaminated site, a lot of contaminated groundwater here, soil, we've got old piping that goes under a building, we've got a site that really considering this going in, you don't know whether this is here unless the site has been pre-characterized. How is this material going to be handled? Uh, to backfill a hole like this with, with water in it, typically we bridge it with drain walk, right? We, if we can, we will do remediation at the time. But again, remediation is something to consider from a Coupa standpoint. Typically the jurisdictional authority really, in my experience, that the Coopas do not have that jurisdictional authority. If you run into cleanup fund, which is a whole nother vast area of underground storage tank and contaminated things, uh, we typically do not have then the process in play when you're removing the tank to solve and cure a ill like this right here. This is a pretty badly contaminated site with free product fuel uh, on shallow groundwater. Uh, another, this is red dye diesel. Uh, you know, this tank leaks pretty hard. Contaminated material, this is uh, a site where we dug contaminated material, right? We typically put it on visqueen, uh, double wrap it, do it up like a burrito, and then, and then fence this and keep it secured. We will then take soil samples out of this, characterize this material. As a Coupa agency in the tank pull process, my encouragement is, is to close that loop. If there was contaminated material there, where did that contaminated material go and where's the disposal certificates for it? Just to keep it, keep it even, right? 
again, safety is first and foremost for us, fencing, shoring, clean areas, all the gamut of things that we run into to try to run a safe, a safe site to, get, to meet the job objective. Uh, one thing I'll mention here because I've run through some of these is our underground service alert and our private utility locator. Working in dense urban downtown areas, there's usually a plethora of utilities and constraints that you can't see. Uh, utilities are a very big deal. If there's one thing that'll get you is a gas or electric line, uh, and that's the last thing you want to run into. Private utility locators are very good. Uh, the one caution on underground service alert, again, very good but oftentimes those utilities are old, abandoned, or unknown, um, so it becomes uh, an issue potentially through the process. Structural shoring, we use structural shoring uh, seldomly on a tank pole. This is actually a, a fire department in Santa Rosa uh, because of the constraints of the site uh, and property lines, structural shoring was installed on the site, and it was a very significant shoring job. So these tanks, I believe there was three of them in here, and it went through, and, and this was all structurally shored and put together, and you could see the tank right here. It's an old fiberglass tank uh, to get this out of here safely. Again, structural shoring is something that's stability. It's all about safety. It becomes a very big liability issue if you have a caving hole. Uh, this site is, again, uh, something where we have a gas line. Uh, this actually goes up. There's a city street, actually, right here on the, on the side of this property. This gas line ran through this property. Uh, this is an excavation that we did in a removal of an underground tank. You could see the structural shoring, fencing. There's a barricade out here on the sidewalk, um, but a gas line, live gas line going right through the middle of the, the, the site. Uh, same site, you could see it. So we have full control of the site. We've got uh, fencing, shoring, exclusion, traffic, closed, the, closed everything down uh, and made it through this, knock on wood, safely. By the way, other things out here that you run into on a particularly gas station sites, because oftentimes this isn't mom and pop's uh, backyard, this is a gas station site or some type of facility that had other things going on with service or uh, facility maintenance. So we oftentimes find and run into, this is a sump, it's a poured in place sump, a four drain sump that was in the service bay of this property. Removed it at the same time. Uh, by the way, there was a, a hoist in there too. Coupa agencies typically will, will just uh, permit it and run that through the same, the same system as part of the overall job. Uncovering a tank, so starting then, you've done your constraints analysis, you've looked at this site, you've objectively looked at all the constraints that are here, looked at what we're trying to do, of course, get this out safely. Uh, there's then begins the process of physical site work, uncovering this tank, right? Removing bedding backfill, existing piping to the extent that you can, although piping can, come by, can sometimes be, uh, again, a problem because it'll go under long runs, of specifically vents or product lines. Uh, then once that, that tank is initially opened and accessed, you wash and steam clean that tank pump contents. Uh, and again, what are we going to do with that material? We've got a, a has-waste hauler or a non-has-waste hauler coming in and taking materials. And then that tank, to open it up and cutting the tank, uh, I remember the first tank pole that I did that the guy jumped out with a sawzall and was going to cut a tank, and that really bothers me. Um, so cutting a tank and opening a tank is a very important component to doing this safely, and intrinsically safe is important. This is the site that we saw actually with the excavation earlier, um, and so here's the tanks. Old gas station, typical system, uncovering this thing, so we're starting to move materials in and out. Here's the tanks themselves. This is that sump. This is a old in-ground hoist. This is my favorite chair that I bring to every tank pole because they take a long time. Man. It's my lucky chair. Um, this is an agricultural property. A lot of these tanks in our area, up in our neck of the woods, are agricultural. Uh, so again, uh, it's not just about uh, city streets and sidewalks. This is a site where they were in a barn, uh, getting in and out. They were, there were three tanks in here and trying to get in and out of here. And again, be safe, getting in and out. And then we have sites like this. This is a site that's downtown Santa Rosa. This was a coal gasification plant that was around in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Very nasty material. Bunch of uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, heavy range uh, hydrocarbons of all organic compounds. These tanks were 36 feet long, uh, and there were three of them. We pulled these, actually two of them. We pulled these, site, these tanks on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday because they were, uh, there was a bank that was built on this site in the, in the recent times. We'll come back to that one in a minute. This is Sonoma County Airport. These are fiberglass tanks. The one caution here, 
uncovering these tanks is a lot of times we'll find bedding and backfill that is pea gravel, which is essentially a bunch of marbles. Uh, pea gravel's great. It's self-leveling, self-compacting, wonderful material, but it's also in, uh, intrinsically unstable. Uh, for anybody to get in that hole, anybody to be messing with that at all, uh, I caution just on pea gravel that it's just a bunch of marbles. This is a tank we dealt with. Uh, this is a 55,000 gallon underground concrete tank. Uh, it was part of an old railroad yard. Uh, this tank had heavy range bunker oil in it. This is back to my bank, by the way. I kind of scrambled, I apologize. But uh, this is trying to get this thing clean, really heavy range, thick stuff, uh, caro syrup, really hard to deal with, trying to get this thing heated up with steam cleaner, trying to get it pumped with a, clean, uh, with a, uh, a pumping contractor. Of course, my excavation contractor's got a backhoe right here trying to loosen these tanks because we're trying to just breach the whale and get it tilted so we could get this stuff to flow and run to one side. Uh, these tanks, as you can see, too, are pretty rotten. Uh, these, in essence, are falling apart uh, as we're working on them, and that is a very big problem for us to try to get these out. Our preference is to get them out whole and haul them out whole. Uh, these tanks were big and old and nasty. Uh, we did get them out, by the way. Uh, this is a fire department tank pool. Uh, fire department guy showed up in, in full gear, uh, and that's the way it was. So again, you could see some structural shoring here. We've got a tight site with a backhoe. We've got some drums. We've got some safety gear. And going through the process, just pumping and cleaning this tank, trying to get it out. Uh, and here we are again. The same time, one caution here. Check and verify, right? Uh, check and verify so that uh, we have an LEL meter here. Uh, a gas tech. You can tell it's an older gas tech because it's a yellow one. Doesn't mean it's not a good meter, but the meter is your way to then check and verify that these tanks are in fact uh, inert. Uh, I like it myself when a, when a regulator shows up with their own instrument to check and verify. I trust my contractor. I've always, I've worked with John Polson and this is John, I've worked with John for over 20 years, but at the same time, I, while I trust him, uh, the process itself is inherently dangerous. Uh, from our standpoint, I, I never mind a, a regulator showing up and wanting to pr us to prove the process. As we go forward then, this is that 55,000 gallon tank trying to clean this thing. Really sticky material, very hard to deal with. So again, we go through a process then of inertia. It's been my experience that regulators and different, different agencies have different uh, requirements on how you inert or how you haul a tank out. It is our desire, because of a practical standpoint mainly, and a co I'll admit cost comes into this, from the standpoint of cleaning and inerting a tank, it's our desire to take a steel tank out of scrap metal. Uh, it's been my experience that you could clean a tank to the point of an, uh, truly being inert, truly being non-hazardous. Uh, and it becomes then a process of simply washing it well enough and being prepared to do so to haul that thing out as a scrap metal tank. If it's fiberglass, by the way, you can, you can often crush it and take it out as simple garbage. Uh, it's just solid waste at that point. Uh, we have airboard rigs, and it's Rule 8 Rig 34, uh, actually 40, I said 34 before, uh, 40, that, that again, uh, with the free emission of vapors becomes an issue for sure. Uh, again, have your proper uh, gas meter, LEL meter in place here, uh, and what are you trying to get to? We spell out in the work plan what our aim is to truly be inert, right? What's your LEL and O2 uh, levels that you're aiming to get to to then take this thing out safely and be truly inert? Uh, we as consultants, by the way, being on site, we're interested in, in screening soil, so we bring a, a, photo, I oops, sorry, a soda, photo ionization detector on site. A PID is great, reads in parts per million, uh, but at the same time, a PID is not reading in the, in the LEL level. Unless you can convert LEL to PPMV, um, it's really not an appropriate meter to be using to prove a, that a tank is inert, in my experience. They're a great tool for remediation, but really they're not something that I see. Uh, I would rather have a, an LEL and combustible gas meter that's specifically calibrated and tooled to do that job. Uh, again, just another trying to get, the, trying to get this tank clean. Same thing. This is a fiberglass tank. So this tank you're going to see here that some tanks are actually whole. Oftentimes when we get to tanks and we uncover them, they're just, they're just falling apart. They're degraded steel. They've been in the ground for decades, and they're just rusted through. 
If the opportunity does arise, we do like to, uh, to seal them, even when they're inert, we'll get, them, we'll get them sealed up. This one, you can see, by the way, that there's some hold down and ballast. Oftentimes, some of the newer tank um, uh, systems, you'll see them installed, so they have, these, they have dead men, uh, uh, concrete dead men that are buried in the ground that hold that tank down. It's just part of the removal process. And you could see that this tank's been washed to the point that it's cut. It's basically ready to come out. This is the Sonoma County Airport. Uh, and these tanks come out of the ground. This is an old gas station. Again, these were functional tanks till we pulled them out, so we've got them sealed. And then you've got the old, you know, unknown tanks that are simply just under a building and trying to get this thing out of here. So we steam cleaned this tank for a number of hours and just put a, vac a vacuum uh, truck on it and just let it sit there and cook for a while because that thing had pretty high vapors on it and we really needed to knock those down um, before we were going to remove it. And then we have surprises. This is a tank that was found during the, a subdivision. Uh, they had a ripper out on this site, and you could see that the guy just ripped this thing open, right? This tank has uh, uh, been ripped open by an earth mover, and hey, guess what? We're on. We got a 10,000-gallon whale buried in the ground in the middle of a subdivision development that they want out of there now because they want to develop their site. And the last thing they're anticipating is to find a tank on this property. Going forward then, dry ice. We rarely use dry ice these days. Uh, in the beginning uh, of the tank uh, uh, work that we did in the early 90s, everything had dry ice in it. We typically do not use dry ice. If you're gonna inert a tank and take it out as a inert tank or as uh, solid waste in the case of a fiberglass tank, we rarely use dry ice. Uh, if you do use dry ice, there's prescriptions for how, much, how many pounds of dry ice you should use per volume of tank. Uh, dry ice itself, you need to be, of course, careful because it's, it's super cold. UST removal process, it's just, again, another set of considerations for us. Lifting it, how, how big is that tank? How big of a machine do we use? When do we get that inspector there? Because we're not going to remove that tank without the inspector being on site. What type of documentation and labeling do we need? Uh, condition of assessment, we've already done that. Uh, removing the scale and soil, so we typically bring it up above ground and we get a shovel on that thing and knock all the soil off it to see how many holes, if we got holes or not. Uh, as that process goes, of course, before we do that, you confirm that it's inert. You get that thing on a truck, you label it, and you plan for the contingencies along the way. Tanks are rather big. Uh, a 10,000 gallon tank is, is typically over uh, 30 feet long, 8 feet diameter. Uh, so you need a sizable amount of equipment to haul that thing off site. This is a fiberglass tank, uh, but nonetheless, a steel tank is the same way. Very big. Uh, this is a 5,000 gallon steel tank, so it comes out of the ground. As we go then, here's a fiberglass tank. This is back out at the airport. Uh, these tanks become per particularly problematic to get out because they were so rotten uh, that we really had a very hard time lifting these tanks. Uh, I know the City of Santa Rosa is here today, Fire Department, and kudos to the City of Santa Rosa to help, uh, help us. We, they actually allowed us to take these tanks out, and you'll see here, as we took these tanks out, this thing just fell apart. It was just falling apart on us. We couldn't get a chain on it. It was ripping it in half. Notice the rivets in this tank, by the way. Old tank. This thing's from the early 1900s. Uh, we barely got it out of the ground. You could see some of the product that is just in there that we couldn't get out by pumping. Again, kudos to the fire department. What we ended up doing is we had a spoils pile that was already heavily contaminated. The fire department allowed us to take the remainder of this tank contents and simply dump it into the pile. It was really the only thing we could do at that point. So again, plan for the contingencies. The fire department allowed us under that one time to dump the contents, the remainder of contents, onto that contaminated pile. We simply made a, a donut in the middle. We were on asphalt already. We had provisions to handle that pile after this job was completed, uh, and they allowed us to do it. Sometimes you run into things that you simply cannot plan for. Scrap metal or hazardous waste, again, our, our, pro our preference is to haul it out as scrap metal on a tank, a steel tank. Uh, it's just a much more practical way to do it. It's a lot cheaper, too, by the way. Uh, there is a, a Unidox form. Uh, that allows uh, certain entities to uh, certify a tank as clean. That differs by agency, by the way, in my experience. We're an A-hazardous contractor, so we oftentimes, with the regulator, certify that tank as being inert. Uh, there's other things on here, like a marine chemist. I've never known a marine chemist in my experience. Um, at the same time, an industrial hygienist uh, can do it as well. There are certain classes of professional that could do it. 
And then this tank, what do you do with it? This is the tank that ripped in half. We got it on a truck. We got it as clean as we could, and we're going to get it out of here. Again, fiberglass, you could simply crush it. Crush it and take it to the, the, your solid waste refuge site. Soil sampling. So soil sampling becomes really when the regulator's on site. That tank comes out of the ground, the regulator witnesses, we're gonna take soil samples. We typically are taking soil samples. In our neck of the woods, we use the tri-regional guidelines, which were written, written in the early 90s. Uh, they basically uh, have a schedule for how many, how many soil samples you're gonna pull by volume of tank. Say for a, a thousand gallon tank, you might pull one sample on the fill end of the tank, one below the tank bottom in native soil. Very typical. Um, from that standpoint, again, it can, it can vary. If we have a contaminated uh, tank pit, we may sample it out more. Uh, as it goes to, things to consider, again, are regulatory requirements, oftentimes in our neck of the woods, uh, encore samplers for volatile organic compounds if you're dealing with gasoline or VOCs, uh, your 5035 EPA method for uh, sample hold and preservation. Uh, looking at then tools and containers, again, we'll use a standard soil tube. Uh, we want ice in that, we want ice in the ice chest, not a bad thing to verify by the way. Uh, sample preservation, analytical testing, what are you going to run this thing for? What are you testing for? Uh, chain of custody is part of your standard documentation and decontamination of both equipment and the site as you go forward and start to close this thing up. Corrective action and investigation, the thing is again is, is that COOPA agencies in my experience have a line that you do not usually go beyond, that they can be part of that, but unless the job is known to be a contaminated site in the beginning, then typically what we're looking at is then the COOPA agency basically is going to hand this off to a regional board, county, or a county health department, LOP, to go forward to take it as a contaminated site. Oftentimes we do know that it's contaminated though, and we do bring in the the COOPA agency to permit that removal, that's their jurisdictional authority, but we'll also bring in then the other regulatory bodies as needed then or as appropriate to oversee the uh, remediation of this. And by the way, one important piece of this is in 2012, the State Water Board adopted the low threat closure policy for underground tanks, which really changed the world of cleanups. Um, one, one practical, though, piece of that is, is that it required the extent to removal of impacted soil to the extent feasible. Uh, I would tell you that from a, from a cost standpoint and a practicality standpoint, if you can do it and you've gone through your constraint analysis, your planning, your permitting, your agency notification, it often becomes a very good and practical thing to do to do some remediation at that time. Uh, because sometimes you never get a second swing at a site. If you've got that tank site open, you've ripped up all that site, you've got asphalt out, you've got all your safety stuff up, you've excluded God and everybody off the site and you've got a giant, giant excavator there. And if you've done the planning and, and thinking about it and, and the process, oftentimes the, the remediation is a practical thing to invoke at the time of tank removal. Again, rat mass removal, a 330 cat excavator is a wonderful tool. At the same time, you gotta watch out, you could get 500 yards above the ground before uh, lunchtime. And if you haven't planned for it, you're in very deep trouble. But at the same time, you can do some practical things. Groundwater pumping treatment and disposal. We oftentimes will pump groundwater as a means to simply get rid of contaminated material. Where are you going to put that water? We actually have 1,000 pounds of carbon in a vessel on a trailer, so we bring that in. We have a master discharge permit with our cities, so we could discharge it oftentimes as sanitary sewer under permit. Very, very practical. At the same time, what is your permitting requirements? How are you going to get rid of that soil? And where are you going to put 500 yards of soil? That's a pretty sizable, pretty sizable hole. At the same time, here's a site, gas station downtown Santa Rosa. This was before, before it all started, right? Active gas station, very badly contaminated site. So we bring in Big John. John starts to tear this thing down. We've got all the permits in play. We had pre-characterized this site. So in essence, we went in with the drill rig and did soil and groundwater sampling. This was a known contaminated site. So this is kind of everything in swing at one time. We're going to remove this, these tanks under jurisdiction from our local COOPA. We're going to tear this building down, the air board. Our local air board has a permit for the teardown because of lead-based paint and asbestos. We've got a demolition permit, and we've got a 330 cat excavator that's very good at tearing the site apart. So there it is. Before, uh, before lunchtime, we basically have a whole lot of scrap metal. We want to segregate this material and start to move it off-site. We don't want to have piles around. Uh, these are the tanks that came out of the ground. I believe the site had uh, five tanks. Uh, we found a couple others as we were going uh, because in this site in particular, 
this site was very bad. This is the pre-characterization work. Uh, again, we're consultants. Uh, we're oftentimes characterizing and remediating sites. We knew it was contaminated. We did a whole characterization of the site while it was still active and uh, before we ever came in here and broke ground. We ended up digging 11,000 tons of soil out of this site. This site was a, the biggest dig I've ever done. I gave John a check for uh, $800,000 for the dig and the disposal. Sites can be very, very bad. This was a cleanup fund site. So the cleanup fund, again, if you're not familiar with it, the cleanup fund is a reimbursement mechanism for the remediation investigation of sites. Uh, we did this with a tremendous amount of planning. Uh, this was a very bad site. And you could see this active spoils pile. We're oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is an active, sorry, this is an active spoils pile right here. So we're hauled, there's a loader loading trucks out as we go, excavators digging. Oftentimes groundwater becomes our vertical boundary for uh, vertical extent. Uh, we knew that we were gonna dig it basically the sidewalk, which is what we did. Uh, site restoration, once you tear this site apart, whether it be from a 500 gallon tank or an entire uh, city block, which is what that last one was, soil backfill and compaction, start to put this site back together. Uh, what type of material you're gonna use? Jurisdictions do differ about what type of backfill. Are you, are you allowed to use recycled material? Oftentimes that control, con, contains asphalt uh, grindings, which in and of itself is, a, is a, by definition a petroleum hydrocarbon bearing product. Uh, again, it, 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 it does differ a bit. And of course, reuse. For us, we do want to reuse material. Every bit of a material that we don't have to haul out and save and reuse, we're basically saving money, we're saving time, we're saving effort. Um, recycling materials, typically, again, the gas station site, the scrap metal, we'll take it out and recycle it. Concrete's recyclable. We'll, we'll save everything we can. When you look at compaction here, uh, there is an ASTM standard 1557 for backfill and compaction. Uh, that's very standard structural lifts. Uh, if you have a site that has a further use to it downstream, because these sites don't lay latent forever, you might have a building going to get built on it, you want to have compaction and site restoration that then is going to meet future needs. Uh, if, for instance, you have uh, ASTM uh, tells you a minimum backfill compaction of a standard structural fill material and 90%, that's your minimum. But if you're going to have, say, a building on there that has a much higher requirement and you're going to use some type of select structural fill or have a higher compaction density to it, those are things to just consider on the front end. And then, by the way, restoration of private and public uh, property. We often rip up sidewalks, asphalt, streets. We've dug in streets. We've taken out utilities. Uh, you got to put all that stuff back together, and that is part of the process. Uh, and here's just backfilling. Uh, this is that big gas station site, so you could see our structural shoring. You could see our, uh, you could see our fencing. And by the way, this is drain rock. You could see it's very coarse drain rock. We're bridging above the water a bit and just doing that. If we bridge the water, we'll use a geotechnical fabric typically on top of it, and then we will start to backfill a select structural fill on top of it. And that excavator sometimes will get down in that hole. Now this hole, uh, because of the shoring, becomes safe, but being in a hole is a whole different thing, uh, being in an excavation. So I believe our OSHA standard's five foot in an in a unsupported or un, unsupported uh, excavation. Typically, I don't like anybody ever in a hole. Uh, in this instance, this is a short structural hole. Uh, we're in the backfill process, and the only guy that was down there was the guy in the excavator. And backfill it, compacting. This is a Bowmag compactor. You could see our spoils piles kind of, you know, getting bigger and littler as we're hauling it out, as we're trying to backfill this thing and get it all put back together. And the objective is to get it back to a semblance of order. This is that same site today. Uh, it's a parking lot. It's going to be a building sometime in the future. And Woodstock was very happy that we cleaned up the environment and safely pulled out underground tanks. So as Coupa Agency, this is my next to last slide. The one thing is with Coupa Agencies, again, get a report of investigation at the end. What happened here? Where's your analytical results, your disposal documentation? Uh, by the way, I believe the regs say that, that tank pulls and this type of work's overseen by a registered professional, typically an engineer or geologist. Uh, your other agencies, so if you have a problem on the site, your other agencies are notified of the release. Uh, an ERF unauthorized release statement is usually part of our process in the reporting of the tank removal. And here's who I am. I appreciate you guys having me here today. As Coupa agencies, I would just close to tell you that you're a very important part of this process. Everybody differs a little bit. Our, our objective out here is to remove tanks safely. There still is a fair number of tanks out in the wide world. And by the way, there's the new requirement that all tanks now are double wall. So we're going to see, I believe, a whole other round of potential tanks coming out of the ground. 
I'll stop there and let Brenda go. We'll take questions after. Thank you very much.